you know, saints in Jeremiah chapter 17, we read, we uh, referenced these verses last night, but I would like to read them. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. I believe many of us have been uh, in these verses uh, recently and enjoying these verses. Blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah and whose trust Jehovah is. He will be like a tree transplanted beside water, which sends out its roots by a stream and will not be afraid when he comes for its leaves remain flourishing and will not be anxious in the year of drought and will not cease to bear fruit. <clears throat> Saints, uh, aren't these verses inspiring? Uh, don't you want to be like the tree that is transplanted beside the waters that sends out its roots, sends out its roots, and is not is not uh, afraid. How does it say? Is not afraid when the heat comes, and not anxious in the year of drought, in the year of dryness, in the year of suffering. Hasn't this year, twenty twenty, been such a year for all of us, for the whole earth? all the inhabitants of the earth facing uh, things that we've just never gone through before, uh, challenges, and even a kind of possibly wearing down. It's very possible that the enemy, Satan, has used all the things that are around us in our environment to wear down the saints, as it says in the book of Daniel that this is his, one of his tactics. On one hand, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's always accusing us, trying to put us down. Uh, but another tactic is to wear, wear us down, little by little. Well, saints, <clears throat> uh, how much the environment affects us is actually dependent on how deep is our fellowship with the Lord? If we have a kind of fellowship with the Lord, that we really have the reality of this verse, we, we send out our roots to the stream. We send out our roots to the flow of living water. You know, this is from Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, the Lord rebukes his people that you have committed two great evils. Firstly, you've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. Which means I was the supply to you. I wanted to be the supply, the source of living water to you. Just as in Psalm 36, with you is the fountain of life. In your life, in your light, we see light. The Lord wants to be such a supply, but it's very possible unconsciously we have turned away from him or we turn away from him in our daily life it's very possible in our morning time with the lord we come to him and then as soon as we leave our prayer room we we forsake him and go to other sources other wells which are the replacements of christ in our heart if we do i tell you saints when the environment rises up against us just very spontaneously, we will have natural reactions, natural reactions, independent of the Lord. But how good it would be if in our daily living, in the midst of all the current restrictions, all the changes, even the limitation in our meetings, this is a real suffering to so many saints, not being able to be together and see one another in, in person, and again, this kind of wears, wears on you. But how good it would be that in spite of all the outward situations, there's an inner flow. There's an inner peace. There's an inner satisfaction. Saints, all of this is possible by the deepening of our fellowship with the Lord. 
You know, in Isaiah, it says that the Lord Jesus was a root out of dry ground. He grew up as a root out of dry ground. That means that, that the Lord is like a tender plant, but all around him is dry. It's dry. Yet he continues to grow. And, and that means he did not look to his environment at all for any encouragement, for any comfort, and for any supply. Saints, if we look to the things around us, if we depend on our environment for our inner peace, oh, I tell you, we will be greatly disappointed. So many things in our environment, sometimes even our family life, sometimes our church life, our professional life, our work life, no satisfaction. If we look to those things for satisfaction, we will be dry. But the Lord Jesus, he had another source. And he tells us, I live because of the Father. I live because of the Father. Always he was on the earth facing all the situations which were so contrary to him. And we were, when we read the Gospels, we, we see this. Yet, what? He had another source. And then he tells us, he tells us, as I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will also live because of me. Saints, we can have the same experience as the Lord Jesus of being like a root out of dry ground, but we're we're still growing. We're like this tree transplanted. What, that means we don't find our supply. We don't find the source of our supply here in this environment. Our source is somewhere else. Our source is hidden. We need to send forth our roots from, John, from Jeremiah 17 all the way to Jeremiah 2, back to the fountain of living waters. How do we do that practically, saints? It depends so much on our personal time with the Lord, our personal fellowship with the Lord. But you, you might say, <clears throat> Brother Ricky, I have the time with the Lord. As some of the saints mentioned last night, I spend the time in the Holy Word for morning revival. I read those two verses, or um, if verses are assigned by the church for morning watch, um, I, I, I read those verses but I still have this kind of experience. Well, saints, <laughs> oh, that we could, we could have this prayer that we had last night. Oh, Lord, deepen the sweet flow of life. Lord, deepen the sweet flow of life. And remember, saints, God is faithful. God is faithful through whom you were called into the fellowship. And it tells us in, in, in Thessalonians, faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. So he's not only calling us into the fellowship. He actually comes to lead us in the fellowship. He wants to be our shepherd, even to, you might say, hold our hand to guide us into fellowship with himself. You know, saints, uh, um, uh, tomorrow... Uh, we will we will get into more details of the procedures of fellowship, but I would like to bring in some some of those points now, even before we touch today's out outline. You know, a key verse, a key verse in the matter of having the personal fellowship with with the Lord, is Psalm uh, twenty-seven, verse four. Psalm 27, verse 4. I believe many of us are familiar with this. It says, One thing I have asked from Jehovah, that do I seek, to dwell in the house of Jehovah all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Jehovah and to inquire in his temple. Actually, there are quite a number of principles here. And i just like to mention a, a a couple now, and we'll get this into this more deeply uh, tomorrow. One thing I have asked from Jehovah. Saints, 
in our fellowship with the Lord, we should have just one goal, one goal. And that is the, the person of the Lord himself. When we come to the Lord, <clears throat> particularly in the morning, when we have a new beginning with him, our goal should be not to, not to just get some supply from him. I, I think very often when we come to the Lord, we have this feeling, oh, Lord, I really need you for today. I have this and this planned. It's going to be a rough day at work or, or lots of things scheduled with the family or maybe even a oh, conference, hospitality, or I have some responsibilities. And, and we see that, we realize, Lord, I need you. I need the supply. And it's very possible, it's very possible that we miss aim. Even in a time, we're, we're coming to be with the Lord, but we're aiming at a, a supply, maybe something apart from him, apart from him. And saints, we need to tell him, Lord, you are my only goal. I want you, Lord. I need you, Lord. And saints, we, <clears throat> we shouldn't have come to the Lord in, a, in the morning and have our time with him with a kind of side goal of getting something, some revelation, some speaking for our prophesying on the Lord's Day. You know, it's very possible for even this to come in in a, in a subtle, subtle way. <clears throat> we might be having some time with the Lord. Maybe we're praying over these verses. Oh, my people have committed two evils. Oh, you have forsaken me. Maybe you're in, 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 in uh, Jeremiah uh, reviewing the, the, the training. And, you're, and then something comes to light. You say, oh, oh, Lord, uh, the two evils. And, and you see something. And, you, and ha- has this never happened to you? That you, you start to think, oh, this might be good for me to share on the Lord's Day. The, and it's like you... It's almost like you start to develop your prophecy for the Lord's Day, misaimed. We, we, we got off of the one thing. We got off of the one thing. You know, that verse, Psalm 27 continues, that I'm to dwell in the house of Jehovah, which we know to, the house of Jehovah is both the church and our spirit, my spirit. And we mentioned this last night. If we talk about the fellowship with the Lord, we must talk about our spirit. <clears throat> we, we should say, Lord, I just want to be in my spirit with you, in your house. To do what? To behold the beauty of Jehovah. Lord, I want to see you. Lord, I, I don't need anything from you. I just want you. I just want to see you. Lord, draw me and I'll run after you. But saints, it's so easy that when we're spending the time with the Lord, uh, uh, privately, uh, personally, that we just wander off. We wander off. In, in, um, in Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God, that we need the helmet of salvation, and we need the shield of faith. Actually, shield of faith is first in verse 16. The the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. And I have found this, saints, in my uh, paying attention to this matter of the personal fellowship with the Lord, of the practice of fellowship, and even, as Brother Lee says, the procedures of fellowship. And I've been studying this matter for some time, and I I really want to recommend this uh, uh, publication to you, Lessons for New Believers. Actually, the four outlines that you received uh, for this conference are all based on this book, uh, chapters 21 through 24. Uh, But also chapter 25 is on the same point. These are the, the last five chapters of this book, Lessons for New Believers. And actually in, in this fellowship, Brother Lee shares this, that with everything, there are procedures and principles. It's kind of like a science. Did you know that practicing fellowship with the Lord is a science? It has procedures. And if we follow the proper procedures, 
we will have a quote unquote success because there are principles. And one of the principles is this one thing we focus on the Lord, we focus on Him, and we tell Him we want to behold Him, His beauty. And, and this, this brings us to a very key principle, saints, and that is that maybe the first thing that we need is to be quiet before the Lord. And when I say quiet, I don't mean that we don't speak, because it's very good when you're with the Lord personally, especially early in the morning, that you utter with voice. If you're too silent, silent with your mouth, it's very possible, and in some cases probable, that we will fall back into sleep. Have, have, you, have, you never, <laughs> have you never fallen into sleep when spending time w- with the Lord? But it's good to utter with a voice. But actually, saints, the key is, the key is, our inner being needs to be quiet. Our inner being needs to be still. You know, in Psalm 46, it says, be still and know that I am God. And, and uh, in, in uh, uh, Psalm 62, it says, My soul is silent before thee. My soul is silent. Saints, what we need is our mind to be quiet. We need our emotion to calm down. We even need our will to just settle down and get it into, in, in, into place. In Psalm 131, verse 2, it says, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Saints, we we need to exercise and we need to practice when we're with the Lord to just have our inner being present and calm. What, but I found in my experience and, and checking the experience actually of hundreds of saints that this is maybe the key point of disturbance when we're spend, trying to spend time before the Lord. And what is that? Our interrupted thoughts, our wandering mind. And I mentioned Ephesians 6 uh, before that. Uh, there, there it says that we need the shield of faith in 616, uh, with which we'll be able to quench all the flaming darts of the evil one. And for this word darts, there's a wonderful note in our recovery version of the New Testament. Uh, if you have that, I would recommend for you to read that, but I would re- I'd like to read you this short note right now. And so, uh, this, sh- this note is on flaming darts flaming darts. It says this, the flaming darts are Satan's temptations, proposals, doubts, questions, lies, and attacks. I'll read that again. The flaming darts are Satan's temptations, proposals, doubts, questions, lies, and attacks. Flaming darts were used by fighters in the apostles' time. The apostle used this term to illustrate Satan's attacks on us. Don't you have this experience, saints? That when you're spending time with the Lord, maybe, maybe you're, you're just praying over this verse. Oh, one thing I have asked. Lord, I just want one thing. And a, a thought comes. A thought comes, an attack from Satan. Maybe, maybe it's not a temptation or a doubt. Maybe it's just uh, this. Maybe it's just a thought. Oh, no, I forgot to do this yesterday. Oh, no, I, 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 forgot, to, I forgot to call Brother Ralph. Oh, oh, he's going to be upset with me. Oh, what time is it? Let me see. Should I call him? No, you shouldn't call him at six in the morning. You would disturb his time with the Lord. But we have a thought, oh, right away. Or an anxious thought like this. Maybe we're praying and all of a sudden we're just saying, Lord, I want to be whole. Oh, no. Oh, I have this appointment. I have a doctor's appointment 
today. Oh, but I have an important work appointment. I can't go to the, oh no, what am I, have you never said in the middle of your, of your personal time with the Lord? Oh no, because of a thought that came in. Saints, that was an attack from the enemy. It doesn't matter the nature of the thought. It, it, it could be a very neutral thought. It doesn't have to be a sinful thought, although that happens sometimes. Even we get bombarded with maybe something we saw in the media or in some show or in some movie. Maybe it was 20 years ago and the enemy will bring that back. Why now? Why at this juncture? Why at this moment in time? Why not yesterday afternoon when, while you were at work? Or while you were home last night. Why, why at this juncture? Oh, because the enemy wants to attack the foundation of our Christian life. Do you remember last night we mentioned fellowship with the Lord is the foundation of our growth and service. If the enemy could frustrate this transaction with the Lord that we're having, in which he, maybe in these next five minutes with the Lord, the Lord was going to, the Lord was going to perform something wonderful within our being to release us from a certain sin, to release us from an aspect of the world, to release us from an idol that's been binding us for years. And just at that juncture, a little thought. Saints, we have to exercise to bring every thought unto, to capture every thought unto the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10, 5 that we need to take captive every thought unto the obedience of Christ. You know, in those verses in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, 4, and 5, it, it talks about warfare. It says the weapons of our warfare. And then as it talks about warfare, it, it, it brings us to the matter of taking captive the thoughts. That shows us that the warfare between God and, and Satan the, the battleground is, of course, man, mankind, human beings, but more specifically, our mind. So, saints, we need the helmet of salvation in a practical way. We need the helmet of salvation. And, and how do we apply the helmet of salvation, saints? We need to exercise our will our will. Re remember, remember, I'm not, I'm not just talking about willpower, but I tell you, the will is very much related to faith, or faith is very much related to our will. You know, you can't exercise faith, even initial faith, without the exercise of your will. You have to choose the, the Lord in salvation and every day thereafter. So in, in 2 Timothy, it says that God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of what? Power. A spirit of power. Did you know you have a spirit of power? Right, right now, saints, how about let's, let's declare wherever we are. I have a spirit of power. Can we say that? Amen. I have a spirit of power. I do. You do. A spirit of power and of love. And of sober-mindedness. That's Second Timothy, chapter one, verses six and seven. We have a spirit of three things. Very interesting. It's our spirit. It's our spirit. But the characteristics of our spirit: a spirit of one, a spirit of two, a spirit of three. These three things match our soul, the functions of our soul. The parts of our soul. So I have a spirit of power that's related to our will. I have a spirit of what? Love, of course, that's related to our emotion. And I have a spirit of sober-mindedness that's related to our mind. So saints, when those thoughts come, we need to exercise our spirit of power. To say, Satan, <laughs> no, not today. Not today. You got me with that thought yesterday, not today. 
We exercise our spirit of sober-mindedness to block the thoughts. Saints, it, it, the, the attacks of Satan are so subtle. It, could, it doesn't have to be something of sin or the world. You know, I, I have four grandchildren. Oh, when, when, when uh, um, I'm traveling and maybe, and they live in, are, are in Orange County in California. So when I go to the training in uh, Anaheim, uh, I know I'm going to stay with them and, and, and see them. And it's very possible that morning, maybe my flights that day, I'm praying, oh Lord, w- uh, one thing I have desired. And I just think of my, my, my little granddaughter. I have, I have their one, two, three, and four years old. Well, actually, the three just turned four. So one, two, four, four. Maybe the, and the little one. I, I just get a thought of the little one. And it could be, oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, huh. I start thinking about her. Oh, I'm going to see her tonight. Oh, ju- just that thought could carry me away for two minutes. Has this never happened to you? Carry you away for three minutes. And then you realize, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, yes, amen. Oh, I'm, re- I'm, I'm in the word. Lord, but we, you know what we do? Usually we repent. We, oh, Lord, forgive me. Don't do that, saints. Don't do that. Don't, don't confess Satan's thoughts. Those are not your thoughts. Even at that juncture, that thought about my granddaughter is not my thought. That's Satan's thought. I don't want to think that now. I want to be with the Lord now. You know, and we're, we, we talked about 2 Corinthians 10. In 2 Corinthians 2, there's a very important verse, 2.11. It says that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. That word could also be translated stratagems or devices. I think in the King James, it says devices. But do you know the root of that word, schemes, devices, stratagems, is actually in Greek a word for thought or mind. So you could loosely translate that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his thoughts. Can you imagine? His thoughts get are like a dart that comes, and because we're so closely connected with Satan, we're even mingled with him. His thought gets injected into my thought, and I think it's my thought. Then, first he attacks me by putting the thought. Then I get attacked by being condemned that I had the thought, so I, oh, Lord, forgive me. Saints, don't do that. Just return and continue. And the more we exercise, the more we exercise our spirit of sober-mindedness and our, and our spirit of power. You know what we're doing? We're exercising our spirit of faith to stand with the word of God, to stand with the reality. And Satan has no choice but to leave us. This is, this is saints, to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Saints, every time we come to fellowship with the Lord, we are in a battle. Satan would like to undo or weaken the foundation of our Christian life, which is our fellowship with him. Oh, I hope these few words, the Lord could use them to cause us to go to him and, and, and deal with him in, in, in this matter, that the Lord would have a way to deepen each, for each of us, our personal fellowship with him. But we'll, we'll come back to this matter in a, in a more detailed way uh, uh, tomorrow. Maybe now we'll come to the, uh, to, to the outline. And I'd like for us to, uh, uh, not just as a summary, but, but to reinforce uh, a couple of the points that we had in last night's uh, 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 fellowship from the, the first outline. Uh, of course, and also we may have some that were not, not with us. But we covered outline one. I'm just going to read through some of the Roman numerals. The meaning and life of fellowship. The meaning. And what is the meaning of fellowship? In Roman one, it says, fellowship is the issue of the eternal life. And it's actually the flow of the eternal life 
within all the believers who have received and possess received and possess the divine life. Saints, fellowship is the issue of the eternal life and is actually the flowing of that life. In a practical sense, fellowship is just life in motion. Fellowship is just life in action. Fellowship, fellowship is the triune God himself who has dispensed into us moving and acting, flowing in our being. When we have the fellowship, the flow of life, we have the presence of the Lord in a practical sense. Point two talks about the two spirits. Fellowship is carried on by the spirit in our regenerated spirit. And I'd just like to highlight again, saints, we, when we're talking about fellowship with the Lord, we must know our spirit. We must exercise our spirit praise the lord our spirit is a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of sober-mindedness but remember our spirit has these three functions which are key in the in the practical experience of fellowship with the lord and those three functions are conscience fellowship and intuition and they work together to bring us into a deeper fellowship with him. Point three says the Christian life is a life of fellowship. And I appreciate it in the, some of the testimonies last night, some of the saints picked up on this point. Yes, we are, we, we are talking about, or we will be talking about mostly and focused on our fellowship with the Lord at a set time. Actually today's lesson. Number two talks about this distinction fellowship at a set time, and then fellowship all the time. And this point is talking about the second part, all the time. The two work together. How can we have a life of fellowship with the Lord where all day long we're in this fellowship? Saints, it, it is dependent on our having a good set time fellowship with the Lord. The two go hand in hand. And we cannot have one without the other. It's important for us to have a set time of fellowship with the Lord so that he can do things that he's not able to do during the day. I tell you, when we come back to this point about being quiet or being still, you know, when a surgeon, when a surgeon is going to perform something on his patient or her patient, even, even a dentist <laughs> going to perform something. The patient must be still. The patient must be calm. If, if you're not calm, oh, the, the, the surgeon can't do, can't do anything with you. In the same way, if we're not calm before the Lord, it's very difficult for the Lord to do some things within us, to get into the deepest part of our being. We say, Lord, make home in our hearts. This is even maybe a daily prayer. But, but we never give the Lord the chance to go deep down into our hearts. You know that, that, that word in Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may make home in your hearts. That word, make home, uh, there in Greek, has a particular meaning of not just home, but make home deep down in our hearts. And maybe we don't give the Lord the chance to go deep down. But saints, our entire life is a life or should be a life of this flow and fellowship with him. Then uh, we mentioned this earlier, point four says fellowship is the what foundation for our growth and service. And then finally, Learning to fellowship with the Lord is the most important lesson for the Lord's serving ones. The most important lesson for the Lord's serving ones. And in point C, because this this connects with what we're going to fellowship in the next outline, I'd like to uh, read this. If you have the outline, you can read along. The Lord always demands something of us in our fellowship with him. Because there are too many matters and things within us in our living and in our environment 
that replace him. Hence, we do not express much of his element. Saints, why, why is it that it's possible we could be in the Lord five years, 10 years, 20 years, and in some areas of our life, we don't progress. In some we do. In some areas we, we, we do. But it could be that in other areas of our life, um, there's no breakthrough. There's no advance. We're just the same. We're just the same. Or very little advance and growth. It could just be this. We need to deepen our fellowship with the Lord. We haven't allowed him the time the opportunity to operate within us. Uh, Another verse, uh, we'll also touch more on this tomorrow, is Isaiah 30, verse 15, where, where it says, In returning and rest, you will be saved. Uh, 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 Sorry, in returning and rest will be your strength. In quietness and in trust, you will be saved. It says four four things here. I may have gotten the verse mixed up a little, but it's four things here. Returning and rest. Quietness and trust. We need to return to the Lord all the time, but especially in, in our time with him in the morning. And sometimes we have to keep returning because we're with him, but we get carried off. Maybe you spend 10 minutes with him. One thought could carry us off for two minutes. Then we return. But we return only for 30 seconds. And we get carried off again for a minute and a half. Then we return. We have to return all the time to him. And we have to rest in him. Returning and rest. It's interesting, in in Psalm 23, rest is also mentioned. That the great shepherd, he's the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He makes me to what? Lie down in green pastures. And, And he leads us by the waters of rest. Do you see, saints, there's something here that we our inner being needs to be at rest before the Lord. And we need to practice, practice to exercise our spirit of power, our spirit of sober-mindedness to quell the flaming darts of Satan. That really is to have the shield of faith, to exercise our, our uh, a spirit, spirit of faith. And the Lord may want to, that day, that morning, in just five or ten minutes, operate a kind of spiritual surgery to undo the replacements that have been in our lives for for many years to expose a certain sin maybe to expose pride that's in our heart it could even be spiritual pride something lurking there and the lord's never had a way but today he would like to do this with just five or ten more minutes with him that we're with him in quietness. And again, I don't mean quietness by our speaking. We might be praying. We might be calling. Actually, just calling on the Lord is a good way to quiet down our being, to quiet our inner being. Actually, singing is a good way to also quiet our being. This morning, <clears throat> I practiced this. I woke up. I don't know if whether, whether it was the same with you, but this morning I woke up with the hymn from last night. Um, I just, it was there. It's not that I was trying to, to think of it or remember it, but this prayer. Lord, I treasure the sweet flow of life. And, and even, even before going to my place to, to where I have my personal time with the Lord, even just in washing up, the hymn was with me. I was singing as I was brushing my teeth. It's as if my time with the Lord started from the time I awoke. He was calling me into fellowship through this hymn. Have you never experienced that? I think we experience that. We wake up with a hymn in our heart. The hymns help us to quiet our being 
uh, be, be, before the Lord. Um, <clears throat> and then point D, the experience, this is point, Roman 5D, the experience of being touched by God in our fellowship with him and surrendering to him is very precious. This experience will not only enable us to be used by the Lord, it will also keep us fresh and living. And then the next point, also keep us from our oldness, how we need a deeper fellowship with him. Okay, now we come to <laughs> outline number two. This is entitled The Effect, Time, and Place of Fellowship. We'll spend most of our time on the, the effect of fellowship, and we can go very quickly through the time and the, the place. So we still have adequate time. The speaking will not be uh, so long, and we really are looking forward to your speaking saints, your overflow, and how the Lord is, is touching you and pressing you with all, all these points. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> here we have uh, at the, uh, in the scripture reading another key verse when we're talking about spending the personal time with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting, like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord Spirit. Beholding and reflecting as a mirror with an unveiled face. Of course, this ties to verse 16, where it says, whenever the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. How we need our heart to turn and turn again to continually turn to the Lord. And then here it says, with an unveiled face, beholding and reflecting as a mirror, as a mirror. You know, uh, you, this, this matter of beholding, which brings us back to Psalm 27, one thing I've desired to dwell in your house, to behold the beauty of Jehovah. Uh, saints, in, in um, you know, it says we're, we're like a mirror, but I'd like you to consider uh, the picture of a lake. Not, not a river now, but a lake. You know, a lake where, there's, where it's very still and uh, when you have a scene, maybe a, a forest or a mountain on the other side of a lake, if the lake is still, you see the reflection exactly of that scene of course it's inverted right but it's it's just very clear that's the kind of beholding and reflecting that we need but what would happen if i would take a stone and toss it into the middle of the lake of course we have that rippling effect and it distorts it distorts the view it distorts the reflection that's what the enemy is trying to do when we're spending time with the Lord, we're beholding, but the enemy is peppering us, it's just throwing stone after stone. Oh, how we need to practice taking captive every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Roman 1, the effect of fellowship with God. <clears throat> A says, according to the evidence in the Bible and our experience, the effect of fellowship has a negative and a positive effect. Have you ever considered this, saints? That when we have fellowship with God, there should be something negative and positive happening. The verse that we have here is John 3.30, he must increase and I must decrease. We explain here. On the negative side, fellowship with God continually removes the undesirable elements within us. On the positive side, the more a person fellowships with God, the more the element of God will be increased within him. Last night we used the illustration of the human body with our metabolism, with the circulation of the blood, the blood flow. We need the flow. And spontaneously, what is happening? Not, it's not just that positive things, oxygen is being dispensed and infused into our being. It's also that negative things are being discharged out of our being. 
I think saints, all of us would admit there are things within us still till today that we know are hindrances to the Lord within us. Other loves, other desires, they might be small things. You know, in, 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 in 1 John uh, 2, it says that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life. It talks about these are the things in the world. The things in the world. There are many things in the world that disrupt, interrupt our love for the Father. You know, those verses say, if anyone has love for the world, love for the Father is not in him. What are those things? Oh, too many to enumerate. And with each of us, something different. How do you remove that? Oh, we, we sometimes get discouraged. Lord, oh, I don't, I, what can I do? Actually, saints, just have more fellowship with the Lord. In the fellowship with the Lord, spontaneously, he can remove those things. He can replace the replacements back with himself, that he could have his proper place in our being. You know, that today we started with First John, I'm sorry, with Jeremiah chapter 17, remember? He who, tr- blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah, and whose trust Jehovah is, he will be like a tree transplanted beside the waters. And that's, that's Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Do you know what verse 9 is? You know what verse 9, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, but the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I believe our recovery version says incurable. The heart is incurable. Well, why are these verses next to each other? Something so positive followed by something so negative. Do you see that? As we're in the fellowship with the Lord and we're sending down our roots and we're just focusing on him, we are allowing him the opportunity then to expose our deceitful heart, to expose the sin that has entangled us many, maybe for our entire Christian life, and to finally uproot that in us. Don't try to deal directly with all the things, whether it's sin, the self, the world. We need to just behold him and allow him the ground to operate within us. Let us continue the reading. We'll get more into this. We can identify at least three categories of things that should not be in us. The world, the self. Uh, sin, the world, and the self. Whether or not we have genuine fellowship with God can be seen by whether this function of removal is manifested in us. This is what I was alluding to last night, saints, that actually our journey with the Lord, in a sense, can be measured not by how much we've gained, but by how much we've lost. How much have we decreased? Then we'll know how much he has increased. And we realize some things, they're easy to let go. Other things, not so easy. And still other things, we didn't even realize that they're within us. And yet other things, we didn't realize that we're holding on to them. Saints, don't try to figure yourself out. Just be with him and allow him to operate, to shine, to speak. He, God, is faithful. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. Just yield yourself totally. Surrender yourself to him in the fellowship with the Lord. Saints, do you realize that in our times with the Lord, five minutes with the Lord in this kind of fellowship can accomplish so much? Ten minutes, the Lord might be able to do something he hasn't been able to do in the last ten years. Imagine if we take 30 minutes to spend time with the Lord in this kind of uninterrupted fellowship. Where, where we are stopping the thoughts. It doesn't mean you'll stop the attack, saints. Satan will always keep trying. But if we exercise to have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the attacks will, will be futile. And, and we'll continue in this fellowship. The Lord can do more within us. But do you see the enemy? If we're taking 10 minutes with the Lord, it's very possible that Eight and a half minutes were spent 
in an in interrupted thought. And maybe we only had a minute and a half in the spirit. Now we all come to the Lord's Day meeting. And I spent one minute and a half that day, three minutes in the Lord's presence the other day. And we all come together. No wonder, saints, at times, the gatherings of the church, we have to admit, not so rich. Yet we all had morning time with the Lord. We all got into the word. But maybe the enemy weakened all of these practices. Oh, how important it is for us to realize what the Lord wants to do in us and to exercise, exercise in this way to deepen our fellowship <clears throat> with him. <clears throat> um, let's continue. Two, if it has been a long time since something has been removed from us, our fellowship with God has diminished or even ceased. Any dealing produced through fellowship is not accomplished once for all. Saints, we need to remain in the fellowship and not be, maybe we've had a little victory and the Lord has been able to do something within us. Uh, don't be passive and don't let your guard down. It's very easy that we give the ground back to the enemy. We just need to be in a, in a, in a state of dependence on the Lord all the time. There is no regulation related to our dealing with things. Rather, this is an effect produced spontaneously through fellowship. And that's, this is why, saints, we can't tell you what to deal with. And, and uh, act, actually, it could be that, that with some saints, they are in either some practice or uh, involved with some things. It's not it's not the world to them. It's not a distraction to them. But with me, it might be. So the Lord might deal with me and not with that person. We shouldn't compare ourselves to others in this matter. But rather just stay in the fellowship with the Lord and make ourselves available to him. Lord, here I am. I'm not looking at others. I don't care about others in this regard. Lord, I just care for you. You have my full undivided attention. Just me and you. Here I am, Lord. You know, and especially in the Old Testament, you can, when people were called by the Lord, like young Samuel, very often, Abraham as well. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Just make ourselves available to him. Point C says, even things given to us by God must be removed. He will require us at a certain point to offer to him all our experiences, spiritual experiences, our spiritual gifts, and the fruit of our work. That is what we have received from him. And we have here the story, the references in Genesis, uh, uh, God's requiring Abraham to offer Isaac, who was given to him by God. Saints, e even victories, even positive things in our lives, the Lord will want to remove them because they become replacements for him. How jealous he is. You know, it tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 11, I've been referencing a lot 2 Corinthians 11 today, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 10, now chapter 11. It says I'm je The apostle says, I'm jealous over you with a jealousy of God. Jealous over you with a jealousy of God. For I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, so your thoughts would be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity toward Christ. Do you, do you see, saints? Even here, the Apostle Paul brings in again the matter of the thoughts. The Lord is jealous over us. The Lord wants us all for himself. Yet, Satan could inject thoughts to carry us away so that we're removed from the simplicity in Christ, from the purity toward Christ. I, I, hope, I hope by all this fellowship, even that I've shared today and that we're having this weekend, I, I, I hope I'm not complicating you. 
by adding these, these things to you. Really, saints, what we're trying to do is strip away many things so that there's just one thing. This is what the, the, the psalmist said, what David said, right? One thing I've desired, Lord, I just want you. I just want you. I, and I hope we could have such a fellowship with the Lord, even, even daily. And that even our Christian successes, our prior experiences, would not become hindrances for us to advance with him today, to go on with him today. Pointy says, those who live in fellowship do not uniformly express the same thing. I mentioned this before. Let us not compare ourselves with others. Also spoken by Paul in 2 Corinthians. Let's not compare ourselves to others in this regard. Let us just seek the Lord for our fellowship with him. He says, God's work is not to make us good, whole, or spotless. Rather, it is to work himself into us. This is his central work, his central goal, to rot himself into us. The increase of God's element can be compared to the process of metabolism in our body. I mentioned this earlier. In metabolism, old elements are constantly replaced with new elements. But how, saints, even in our physical body, how does metabolism work? It's by our eating by our drinking, by our breathing. We need to, and these are, the Lord made us this way purposely to show us we need to eat him, drink him, uh, breathe him, enjoy him. If we don't do this, we have no hope. Don't think, oh, I have to improve so that I can enjoy the Lord, so I can come to the Lord. No, if you don't come to the Lord, you'll never improve. You'll never change. We need, we need the, living spiritual metabolism that comes by eating, drinking, breathing, and exercising. Amen. A person who learns to live in fellowship is constantly undergoing a metabolic change. Those in religion have an outward standard, but Christians do not. Do not. The only need of a Christian is to fellowship with God. Saints, it's true in the, in the church life, there are no standards. Maybe we have developed some, some personal rules, regulations, which we put on ourselves and on others. But actually, from the word, the, the, only, the commandment in the New Testament is walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. It really is to live Christ. Amen. Then we come, the second half of, of uh, second part of this uh, outline is the time to fellowship with God. That's Roman two. And then point three is the place to fellowship with God. And here is very simple saints constant. uh, The time to fellowship with God is all the time. That's point one constantly, constantly. We should have a kind of fellowship with him. Uh, Oh, I, I, I should read. I should read these two points. Practically speaking, one and two, Fellowship with God, like breathing, should be constant and not limited by time. All the time we're breathing, even unconsciously. I mentioned breathing now, so you will think of breathing. But this entire hour we've been fellowshipping, you didn't think about your breathing probably one time because you did it spontaneously. That's how our fellowship with God should be. Just all the time we're just in fellowship with him. Even telling him, talking to him, Lord, thank you. Oh, the sun is shining. Oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord, it's getting cold. Oh, Lord, it's raining. Oh, Lord, this. Oh, Lord, that. Just constantly in fellowship with him. But point two is very important. And maybe maybe it would surprise you. But this is taken directly from a Brother Lee's writing in this book, Lessons for, for New Believers. It says, we should learn to fellowship to such an extent that where, even when we quarrel and are upset with others, speaking angry words to them, we would still be in fellowship with God. Isn't that wonderful? Don't, is that your experience? Or is that your aspiration? Oh, I hope, I hope it's all our aspiration. Even when I'm upset, I'm one with God. Even when I'm speaking angry words, I am one with the Father. You know, it, 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 used, to, it used to puzzle me 
uh, when I would read uh, the, the, the Gospels. And, and then I would, I would see that the Lord Jesus got upset with people and that he went into the temple and he overturned the, you know, he overturned the tables and he got the whip, you know, of, of cords and he pushing the animals. Don't make my father's house a house of, a, a, a house of merchandise. And I, I thought, oh, when I was a young Christian, I thought, Lord, did, did, did you lose your temper here? It doesn't, you didn't act like a Christian. This was my thought. And, but one day I was reading and I saw, oh, he, uh, he went into the temple and it says he overturned the, 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 the table of the money changers. Do you remember that? He overturned the table of the money changers. And it says, and then it says, and he turned to those who were uh, uh, selling the doves and says, get these things away from here. Then I, then I saw, oh, he, he overturned the table of the money changers, but he didn't overturn the table with the doves, with the birds. He, he, he told them, get these things away from here. And, and if he had overturned that table, uh, he, you could hurt the birds. And he would, didn't do that. Did you, did you realize his anger was even in, in control? He overturned these, the animals, the, 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 the bigger animals with the whip of cords. He got them out because he wasn't hurting them. But then to those who were selling the doves, he wouldn't hurt, damage the doves. Even at that time, he was expressing the righteous anger of the father. He was one with the father, and he wasn't too much. Saints, it's possible to, to have such a fellowship with the Lord. Because he said, he told us, as I live because of the father, so he who eats me will also live because of me. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Do you believe that if you eat him, you could be such? Now, don't say, hey, amen. I, I want this so that I can get angry with people and still be in my spirit. Uh, forget about that. The point is, we can have a fellowship with the Lord that no matter what happens in our daily life, we are still one with him. But how can we get there? Saints, it depends so much on point B. Setting aside fixed times. Having set times with the Lord. And that's what we're trying to strengthen, especially in our fellowship this weekend. And so we have, through these verses, various examples. I, I'll leave the reading to you of people in the scripture who's had times with the Lord, Old Testament, New Testament, says if a Christian wants to learn to live before the Lord and have constant fellowship with him, he needs to be one who touches God early in the morning. According to our experience, it is best to set aside a time in the morning before the day dawns. We have not, not had contact with any person or thing or outward environment and inner and our inner being. Uh, inner being uh, are quieter. Our inner beings are quieter. Saints, again, I said before, we have no regulation. So don't, don't um, take this as a regulation. Uh, the principle is this. The principle is this. Touch the Lord first. Give him the first place in your day. The first place in your day. Not all of us get up before the day dawns. Some are nurses or doctors who have rotations that don't allow you to do this. The point is, before you contacting people, before contacting things, even before contacting the Lord's work, be with him. Give him the first place, even, even a set time, a set time. And then we have examples in the scripture in point three. Point four says, those who want to rise early should learn the lesson to, of going to bed early. It is very practical. God ordained that man should go to bed when the sun goes down and rise up when the sun comes up. Yet the devil simulates man to be active when the sun goes down and to sleep when the sun comes up. So many evil things happen at the nighttime when we actually should be sleeping. A new believer especially should set aside time during which he can fellowship with God. We should spend at least 20 minutes fellowshipping with him every day. The best is to have at least half an hour to one hour every morning. And this is true. But again, there are no standards. We need to be where we are. 
until the Lord brings us on. Even five or ten minutes, very valuable before the Lord. Drawing near to God in the morning and fellowshipping with him not only causes our spirit to be fed and nourished, but also causes our body to be healthy. If we touch and absorb God every morning, we will have an intelligent mind, clear thinking, and sound judgment. I believe many of us can testify to this. It may be necessary to make some resolution and determination and to find another brother or sister who has the heart to practice in order to remind and encourage one another. Of course, this doesn't mean that we always have a corporate time with the Lord. We need a personal time, but we could make a pact with someone that will check with us. Have you had your time? How's your time going with the Lord? And you check with me and we encourage each other on. Maybe to establish the habit, you could have 10 minutes with someone to call each other, pray together for 10 or 15 minutes, and then have personal time in order to build up the habit in a very practical way. The body can help us in this regard. And then saints, just as there's two aspects to the, to the time of fellowship, there are two aspects to the place of fellowship. The place to fellowship with God is anytime and anywhere. There's no place where we cannot fellowship with God. Whether we are traveling, working, taking a walk, listening to a message, we can fellowship with God at all times and in all places. However, the other side is to have a set place, setting aside a specific place. In order to pray properly, a quiet place is needed. We should not say that since fellowshipping with God is a matter in spirit, the outward environment does not matter. And here we have an example of the Lord. He found a place, a deserted place, where even it says they had to hunt for him to find him. We need such a place that has no outward distraction. Saints, we battle enough the inward distraction. We need to find a place that at least is free of outward distraction so we can spend the time with, with the Lord. Maybe we'll pick this up and say a little bit more in, in tomorrow's session. But anyway, maybe I've said enough. Uh, brothers, I think I will stop here. And uh, we surely would like to hear, I believe, from the saints, uh, their response, um, what, what they receive from this fellowship. Again, saints, I hope we all have this prayer within us. Oh, Lord. Deepen the sweet flow of life in me and in all the saints. Amen. So I turn it to Brother Ron or the other brothers.